everybody, this is Craig from the University of Applied Research and Development. This is our Emergency Response and Risk Management podcast. I'm delighted to have Rita Kepner with us, Dr. Rita. She's done her research in emergency alert systems, and she is the public affairs reserve spokesperson for FEMA. Rita, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll slightly modify. I'm only one of many reservist public affairs spokespersons, so I'm not the one and only, but one of many. Well, for us today, you are the one and only on our podcast. We're delighted to have you. Thanks for giving us your time. Well, it is my pleasure. Hey, Rita, why don't you tell us, start by telling us about your research. Um, I noticed some interesting things about issues and challenges regarding systems and broadcast costs, leadership, legislation. Why don't you tell us about your research and why you did it and what you found? I had been doing field work as a spokesperson for FEMA after catastrophic disasters. And in that role, I got to visit many broadcast studios that would welcome me in and allow me to provide important information to survivors of catastrophic disasters. Over the course of a few years, I began to see a decline in the warmth of the welcome. And it got to a place I was so concerned that I temporarily stepped back to do some research to find out why I was seeing such a dramatic change in the way particularly broadcast media was responding to my requests to provide quality information to disaster survivors. So I went back to school and then I began that PhD research uh, that sounds like you've read the paper, so thank you for that. It was very, very interesting and obviously you're motivated by a change in the way that broadcasters were responding to you. Tell us a bit more about that. Uh, as I said, initially I would go in particularly to broadcast studios and ask them to do this information. They would often stop everything, walk me into the studio, put a microphone in front of me and ask me to explain what people needed to do to try to start rebuilding their lives. Um, I noticed that when I went to print media, that was still happening. But when I started, when I was going into some of the broadcast studios, I was getting a cold shoulder like, oh, you have some information? Oh, well, you know, if you have anything in writing, leave it on the desk. Bye, we're busy. And it was troubling because, well, many reasons. Of course, you know, you always feel, a, most people feel a little badly when they're rebuffed about anything. So emotionally, there was that response. But mostly, I was just horrified because I had information people needed, truly, desperately needed in some cases. You know, they needed to know where drinking water was available. They needed to know where to go to register for further assistance. I mean, there's very important information that I was trying to provide to people who needed it. So when I realized that there was something breaking down in the system, and I went back to the university to try to figure it out. I mean, a classic case, I think, of sense-making. Uh, we talk about that a lot in university circles, the business of sense-making. Well, that's what I went about trying to do. And I actually was quite astonished to find fairly quickly the answers to my questions. I wound up doing complex traditional research, but I immediately found out there had been change in legislation. And the legislation change allowed broadcasters to substitute infotainment for public service information. So while community newspapers were still providing public service information, broadcasters were being permitted to choose between paid advertising, which they nominally called public service. I'll explain why in a second. They, they chose to use advertisements instead of public service. So when I would go into the door, they didn't have any need to fill uh, what had previously been a requirement, a legal requirement to provide public service there was no longer a legal requirement for them to provide the public service that I was bringing to them. They had 
lobbied, um, some broadcasters had lobbied the American FCC, Federal Communications Commission, to allow them to use um, a combination of public service and advertisement, which was much more lucrative for the broadcasters. So Americans frequently see commercials that are, um, for example, um, oh, I'm selling mattresses at such and such a place, but if you stop by and bring a coat, we're collecting coats to give to children in the wintertime. And because they combined their advertisement with a, an appeal to assist people, the broadcasters could count that as minutes required for public service. Uh, they could have a breast cancer marchathon and have some public, uh, some uh, pro entity provide a commercial and say, and we're sponsoring the breast cancer marchathon. Those minutes were counted. Also, the broadcasters got to collect payment for the advertisement. And the broadcasters, the broadcasters could also mark off against their tax returns the fact that they had done these advertisements that included a public service. So for the broadcast corporations, it was a big win-win. But what happened is they had enough paid these combo public service and advertisements that they no longer needed any more free minutes. There were a certain number of minutes, a percentage of minutes that they were required, depending on their contract, to, to accomplish every week, every month, every year. And now they were accomplishing those minutes with paid advertisement, so they were turning us away at the door. And a lot of other public service kinds of announcements. Uh, one of the references in my paper is from uh, a gentleman who couldn't find out why he couldn't get his nonprofit entities. They used to do free, um, you know, li just little promos when the nonprofit was having a meeting or a gathering or something that they needed the community to know about. Um, Mr. L. R. Red did that paper. It's in my footnotes in the in the research, uh, and it turned out that it was the same reason. So I discovered that public information of a variety of sorts, disaster information, community information, was essentially being stopped from broadcast entities. And then as I learned that, my research led me to go to, again, you know, in and out of the FCC and then refine what I was looking at, refine when these changes were made, how they were made, and I discovered as you do in research, it was over time, it wasn't an instant, so the changes were made slowly, but they accomplished the goal of giving the broadcast industry the, the airwaves that we used to um, allow them to use, and now we were paying them to use. I found out that it went even further for the emergency alert system, where those messages previously had been mandatory. So if you had run now, there's a tornado coming, uh, prior to these changes, that was mandatory for broadcast entities to run that message. Run now, there's a tornado coming. Run now, there's a tsunami coming. They were supposed to do that mandatorily. When they made these changes, then that became optional. They could do it if they wanted to, but they didn't have to. And the rationale that was given was, you know, we have contracts, and if there's an important football game playing, we can't interrupt that to do this run now, there's a tsunami coming message. Wow. It would be a breach of contract. That was the rationale. And then I found in the course of the research some actual examples of a tsunami coming that, that warning wasn't given until after the football game. Fortunately, that particular case, it was a small tsunami in Hawaii. I mentioned it in my research. It didn't hurt anyone, and they did announce it 
at the end of the football game. <laughs> so obviously, in some circumstances, that could be extremely life-threatening to have them be allowed to do the option, but that is still the legal situation here in the United States, and uh, people can go to the FCC website or the emergency alert system website and can confirm that it is now optional. Again, further into the research, I, you know, asked questions because I was doing qualitative research and I was able to directly ask questions to broadcasters or their representatives. And in that discussion, I discovered that many of them had conversations with their legal teams and their legal teams advised them, well, if it's not mandatory, if it's optional, we should opt out because what if we run uh, a warning message and it, either it turns out to be an accident, which occasionally happens, and I mentioned one of those in my research. If we, if, if we tell people to run and then someone twists their ankle and get injured, then the broadcast station may be sued. Therefore, we should always consider those optional and maybe even not run them. You know, maybe we should even just not do it. So some stations don't. Uh, many are more interested in helping people, so they will run them, but it's optional. That seems incredible to me. I don't, I don't understand or I don't accept maybe that the broadcaster made the decision previously that we will have some sort of liability. It sounds more like a justification to go with not doing the alerts, is that someone might twist their ankle and we'll get in trouble. Surely the saving of many lives is more important than a twisted ankle. Well, part of the framework for my research was you know, did what was the corporate capitalism, that's what I call Kantian capitalism, which is if you're inspired internally with the right reasons, won't you do the right thing? And particularly because it's so important. So I assumed that the drive uh, for the commercial entities to do the right thing would override canceling the warnings. But of course, you know, as we know in research, everything is more complicated. So I did find out that there were other reasons besides the lawyers, although that was a big one. The other one was often the people in the stations were simply not trained and didn't know what an emergency, uh, an emergency alert message actually meant. So I talked to some broadcast representatives who told me that when they heard the emergency alerts, they assumed it was a news tip, not a reason to alert the public. They thought it was a reason for them to tell their editor that they had to run to the shoreline where the tsunami was and take pictures of people, you know, dying in the waves. Wow. And they were sincere. <laughs> they thought those alerts were news tips. Well, they were sincerely so that wrong. Was Incredibly bad training. Um, so the lawyers, the poor training. Uh, another one was the emergency alerts came in on a special, you know, computer, a special box that came into the studios. Well, some of those studios were not staffed full time. So sometimes the box would make it sound, but there was nobody there to respond. Uh, occasionally, there was someone who was assigned to be emergency alert system monitor, but they only came to work once or twice a week. So if the system happened to have an alert at the moment that that person was in the building, then that person might actually have been trained to know that they were supposed to relay it. So very complex. It is. And... Um Oh, I guess we're, we're very fortunate that you did your research into this, so we actually understand this. And I wonder if the public have had communicated to them that they cannot trust or rely on the media to relay these emergency alert system warnings um, as they may have done in the past. I know for myself, I live in Southeast Asia, and we expect the media, and the media does, transmit those types of warnings. But I guess the public needs to be informed if there's a change to that. 
Well, that was one of the reasons that I was adamant about trying to get my research out. And in most countries, it is still mandatory if there is an alert that it be relayed. Uh, I, I did find that out also in doing the research. But it's still not mandatory in the United States. And even though I've it'd been, you know, what I thought were reasonable places, it, it's not something the public is being told. Most people don't know that those alerts are optional. Most people do believe that if something really bad happens, that they will get a message. And, of course, that's confounded even more because sometimes local communities have a messaging system whereby, in fact, I, I got one just a few minutes ago here at my home. I got a phone call from my local electric server, and they were advising everyone in the service area that we would have a power outage uh, in a few days because they needed to do some repair work on some wires. So people the public is further confused because some messages do get to them other ways. So they don't question whether or not they are or are not going to get the messaging that they need. But then that's changed too because we've had a number of fire situations, particularly in California, where people never heard and in some cases people died because they didn't get the fire warning to get out in time. It is a very complicated issue, but to answer your question simply, in the United States, the vast majority of people do not understand that warning, mandatory warnings may not reach them. So uh, leaders that are working in emergency response and risk management, um, disaster response, how can they better work with broadcasters and news media to make sure these alerts and warnings are actually transmitted. Is there any way that they can work with broadcasters? Uh, some communities have made attempts. The, there was an organization in Oklahoma, which is a center for tornadoes in the United States. Uh, the broadcasters used to have regular meetings, and they came together and they agreed as a group that if they got a tornado warning, all of them would drop their paid um, airwave messaging, whatever that was, whatever programming, they would all agree in advance so that they wouldn't outcompete each other. So everybody agreed if they got a warning, they would forward it. But it took meetings, it took communication, it took people just making ethical decisions to do the right thing, but it took coordination. And I have heard recently that they're no longer having those community meetings, and I'm not sure if that's affected the transmission of the tornadoes because I'm not living in that area right now, and I haven't, you know, I haven't paid attention. But I was actually living in Norman, Oklahoma, which is the center for where those are, uh, the tornadoes come in, and it wasn't uh, a place where I did my some of my master's degree studies. So I'm familiar with how that system works. But I think they're still doing a pretty good job in Tornado Alley, but they're not necessarily doing, well, they're definitely not doing as good a job in the tsunami zones along the West Coast because I've talked to a, a number of people in the emergency operation offices along, and they're appalled that they can't count on the media to transmit their information in a timely way. Uh, the people who work in the emergency operation offices sometimes purchase separate software of their own to alert their local communities by zip code. So to answer part of your question, that's one of the things that emergency alert people are doing. In Washington, D.C., they tried to create a whole new warning system that would go around the emergency alert system um, now you're going to catch me because I won't remember what the acronym means, but P-A-W-S, Public Alert and Warning System, P-A-W-S, they call it. 
and they're trying to make that one be more functional. Uh, I they've tested it recently, and they found that in many in a large percentage of the cases where they tested that system, the broadcasters didn't have the right equipment. They didn't have it turned on. Uh, they weren't listening. And once again, the same bit of information I found out, the, pe the people in the studios weren't trained and they didn't know what it meant. They didn't know what they were supposed to do other than perhaps use it as a news tip and gather a team and send them out. This um, research that you've done and what you've shared with us is hugely valuable because our people running and doing our, our programs and running large companies and organizations and really interested in really saving lives is the whole purpose of being involved in the sector. Um, this is really valuable. I think the key takeaways for me, and please give me some feedback if I've misunderstood, but I think a leaders in the sector should understand the landscape, number one, understand who will transmit these warnings and who will not. And then number two, start to build equity and relationship and credibility with organizations who can get the message out to communities, whether that's the media, whether that's other organizations, but build relationship so that at least when you send a message or want to go and see people, that equity is there. And I know that you already had equity, but then there was a change. So maybe there's a way that leaders can work around that. And I think the third thing that you just said there is leveraging technology because technology changes very fast. So how can we use technology, social media, and other systems to get the message out there? Even if the media doesn't play ball, we can uh, find some way of getting the information out there. What do you think? I, I do think so, and, and I did refer to that in, well, you know, at the end of my research process that, uh, and, and actually, and you'll know that I, that paper that you, you read, I finished it in 2010, so it's 10 years ago now. So I had to guesstimate how fast technology was changing, but that was one of the points I made in the paper that I thought it was possible to leverage technology to be able to accomplish that. And I, I predicted and projected that we would move to a place where the technology would work two ways because it is extremely beneficial, not only if the emergency community warns people, but that they also have a mechanism to get feedback to say, I'm trapped and I need help, or I heard you, or I heard you, but I know my neighbor didn't. So it, I feel it is important that that information be live and be, be, it can go back and forth. So a one-way street is a good thing. So broadcasting, transmitting, getting it out there, as you were um, talking, uh, I mean, that's very important. But it is also important to saving lives that we get some information back so that the people who are in the emergency departments can figure out the best way to get to people and save lives. Yeah, that's really great. Hey, Dr. Rita, just before we finish, for leaders that are in emergency response and risk management, looking at developing their careers, what sort of career advice or career wisdom would you, would you share for um, our students as they graduate and, and they understand that the skills that they have in emergency response, they could use them in a range of different industries, uh, not just oil and gas, not just maybe for the Red Cross, they could work in a range of industries and all around the world. So how could they better position themselves to be well equipped? Uh, I think that's a, a really good question. And I think I want to give the answer that I've always given to students, including my own son growing up, was build a good toolkit. And then you will find that there are places that you can go and you pull out the tools that you need to accomplish what the mission is. I think the best for people who are in this line of work, the most important skill you can have is, well, there's two. One, have a big and open heart so that you are sincere in pursuing the mission, the goal of mattering, of making a difference. You have to really want to make a difference. You have to really want to care. And that centers you with the drive to learn and refine the skills you're going to need. Communication is incredibly important. Communication, whether that's 
you know, the, the technical commu co computer skills, whether it's good public speaking, whether it's good writing skills, communication is key. Making sure that people understand you is key. So the most important thing students can do is hone their communication skills. It's really a good thing <laughs> to learn to read and write in a manner that other people understand. And, and in multiple languages, and we live in you know, a big world now. So that would be another potential skill, a potential tool to put in that kit bag. If you're interested in other cultures, if you're interested in other languages, you might be interested in travel, then you might want some, some different languages in your skill kit. The communication in general, communication in one or two or three languages, uh, the ability to travel is important for many disaster positions, but not all. Uh, the, a lot of the IT world, you know, people can do remotely now. So again, more skills. How, what, what are your remote useful skills? We're all getting a, a wonderful opportunity to practice remote skills with our coronavirus. So it, there's a, a bit of a silver lining, I guess, a blessing in disguise that people are being forced to learn those skills. So once again, it's another little tool to put in the, the box, the kit box. Education, clearly, is <laughs> in general. You can't learn enough. Uh, any topic, if you're going into a community, the more you know about history, the more you know about the different, you know, ethnic communities that are there, the, the more curious you are as a human being. Again, put that curiosity in the kit bag. The more you can, the more tools you can put in the kit bag, the ones that feel right to you. I mean, it'd be silly for someone to study Swahili if you're not ever interested in that language or going to Africa, as an example. But there are going to be tools that fit you as a student. So, you know, know yourself, find the tools that, you know, they feel good in your hand and put those in your kit bag. And if you're interested in this field, you know, there's always going to be weather, <laughs> there's climate change, there are industries that need disaster support. You, you're just bound to be able to find a job that you can love if you're driven by the passion to make a difference and if you've built yourself a good skill kit. Brilliant. That's really great advice. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Rita, for your time with us today and sharing your research, sharing your experiences and wisdom for our graduates as well. Thank you so much for your time. My true pleasure and best of wishes to all your students and to you too.